This is Mr. Mays. Welcome back to Chapter 10 of Where the Red Fern Grows. Chapter 10. Mama made me a cap out of my first coon hide. I was as proud of it as Papa would have been if someone had given him a dozen Missouri mules. Mama said afterwards that she wished she hadn't made it for me because, in some way, Wearing that cap must have affected my mind. I went coon crazy. I was out after the ringtails every night. About the only time I didn't go hunting was when the weather was bad, and even then Mama all but had to hogtie me. What wonderful nights they were, running like a deer through the thick timber of the bottoms, tearing my way through stands of wild cane, climbing over drifts and jumping logs, running, screaming, and yelling, Hoo-wee! Get em, boy, get em! Following the voices of my little hounds. It wasn't too hard for a smart old coon to fool old Dan, but there were none that prowled the river banks that could fool my little Ann. As Grandpa had predicted, the price of coonskins jumped sky high. A good size hide was worth from four to ten dollars, depending on the grade and quality. I kept the side of our smokehouse plastered with hides. Of course, I would spread them out a little to cover more space. I always stretched them on the side facing the road, never on the back side. I wanted everyone in the country to see them. The money earned from my furs was turned over to my father. I didn't care about it. I had what I wanted, my dogs. I suppose that Papa was saving it for something because I never saw anything new turn up around our home. But, like any young boy, I wasn't bothered by it and I asked no questions. My whole life was wrapped up in my dogs. Everywhere I went, they went along. There was only one place I didn't want them to go with me, and that was to Grandpa's store. Other dogs were always there, and it seemed as if they all wanted to jump on old Dan. It got so about the only time I went to see my grandfather was when I had a bundle of fur to take to the store. This was always a problem. In every way I could, I would try to slip away from my dogs. Sometimes I swore that they could read my mind. It made no difference what I tried. I couldn't fool them. One time, I was sure I had outsmarted them. The day before I was to make one of my trips, I took my furs out to the barn and hid them. The next morning, I hung around the house for a while and then nonchalantly whistled my way out to the barn. I climbed up in the loft and peeked through a crack. I could see them lying in front of their doghouse. They weren't even looking my way. Taking my furs, I sneaked out through the back door, and, walking like a tomcat, I made it to the timber. I climbed a small dogwood tree and looked back. They were still there and didn't seem to know what I'd done. Feeling just about as smart as Sherlock Holmes, I headed for the store. I was walking along, singing my lungs out, when they came tearing out of the underbrush, wiggling and twisting, and tickled to death to be with me. At first, I was mad, but one look at dancing little Anne, and all was forgiven. I sat down on my bundle of fur and laughed till I hurt all over. I could scold them a little, but I could no more have whipped one of them than I could have kissed a girl. After all, a boy just doesn't whip his dogs. Grandpa always counted my furs carefully and marked something down on a piece of paper. I'd never seen him do this with other hunters, and it got the best of my curiosity. One day, while he was writing, I asked him, Why do you do that, Grandpa? He looked at me over his glasses and said kind of sharp, Never mind, I have my reasons. When Grandpa talked to me like that, 
I didn't push things any farther. Besides, it didn't make any difference to me if he marked on every piece of paper in the store. I always managed to make my trips on Saturdays, as that was Coon Hunter's Day. I didn't have to stand around on the outside of the circle anymore and listen to the coon hunters. I'd get right up in the middle and say my piece with the rest of them. I didn't have to tell any whoppers for some of the things my dogs did were almost unbelievable anyhow. Oh, I guess I did make things a little bigger than they actually were, but I never did figure a coon hunter told honest-to-goodness lies. He just kind of stretched things a little. I could hold those coon hunters spellbound with some of my hunting tales. Grandpa would never say anything while I was telling my stories. He just puttered around the store with a silly little grin on his face. Once in a while, when I got too far off the beaten path, he would come around and cram a bar of soap in my pocket. My face would get all red. I'd cut my story short, fly out the door, and head for home. The coon hunters were always kidding me about my dogs. Some of the remarks I heard made me fighting mad. I never saw hounds so small, but I guess they are hounds. At least they look like it. I don't believe little Ann is half as smart as he says she is. She's so little those old coons think she's a rabbit. I bet she sneaks right up on them before they realize she's a dog. Some of these nights a big old coon is going to carry her off to his den and raise some little coon puppies. I always took their kidding with a smile on my face, but it made my blood boil like the water in Mama's tea kettle. I had one way of shutting them up. Let's all go in the store, I'd say, and see who has the most hides in there. It was true that my dogs were small, especially little Ann. She could walk under an ordinary hound. In fact, she was a regular midget. If it had not been for her long ears, no one could have told that she was a hound. Her actions weren't those of a hunting hound. She was constantly playing. She would play with our chickens and young calves with a piece of paper or a corn cob. What my little girl lacked in size, she made up in sweetness. She could make friends with a tomcat. Old Dan was just the opposite. He strutted around with a belligerent and tough attitude. Although he wasn't a tall dog, he was heavy. His body was long and his chest broad and thick. His legs were short, big and solid. The muscles in his body were hard and knotty. When he walked, they would twist and jerk under the skin. He was a friendly dog. There were no strangers to him. He loved everyone. Yet, he was a strange dog. He would not hunt with another hound other than little Ann, or another hunter, not even my father. The strangest thing about old Dan was that he would not hunt even with me unless little Ann was with him. I found this out the first night I tried it. Little Ann had cut the pad of her right foot on a sharp, jagged flint rock. It was a nasty cut. I made a little boot of leather and put it on her wounded foot. To keep her from following me, I locked her in the corn crib. Two nights later, I decided to take old Dan hunting for a while. He followed me down to the river bottoms and disappeared in the thick timber. I waited and waited for him to strike a trail. Nothing happened. After about two hours, I called to him. He didn't come. I called and called. Disgusted, I gave up and went home. Coming up through the barn lot, I saw him rolled up in a ball on the ground in front of the corn crib. I immediately understood. I walked over and opened the door. He jumped up in the crib, smelled little Ann's foot, twisted around in the shucks, and lay down by her side. As he looked at me, 
I read this message in his friendly gray eyes. You could have done this a long time ago. I never did know if little Anne would hunt by herself or not. I'm sure she would have, for she was a smart and understanding dog, but I never tried to find out. Little Anne was my sister's pet. They rubbed and scratched and petted her. They would take her down to the creek and give her baths. She loved it all. If Mama wanted a chicken caught, she would call little Anne. She would run the chicken down and hold it with her paws until Mama came. Not one feather would be harmed. Mama tried old Dan once. Before she got to the chicken, there wasn't much left but the feathers. By some strange twist of nature, little Anne was destined to go through life without being a mother. Perhaps it was because she was stunted in growth, or maybe because she was the runt in a large litter. That may have had something to do with it. During the fur season, November through February, I was given complete freedom from work. Many times when I came home, the sun was high in the sky. After each hunt, I always took care of my dogs. The flint rocks and saw briars were hard on their feet. With a bottle of peroxide and a can of salve, I would doctor their wounds. I never knew what to expect from old Dan. I never saw a coon hound so determined or one that could get into so many predicaments. More than one time, it would have been the death of him if it hadn't been for smart little Ann. One night, not long after I had entered the bottoms, my dog struck the trail of an old boar coon. He was a smart old fella and had a sack full of tricks. He crossed the river time after time. Finally, swimming to the middle and staying in the swift current, he swam downstream. Knowing he would have to come out somewhere, my dogs split up. Old Dan took the right side, Little Ann worked the other side. I came out of the bottoms onto a gravel bar and stood and watched them in the moonlight. Little Ann worked downriver, and then she came up. I saw her when she passed me going up the bank, sniffing and searching for the trail. She came back to me. I patted her head, scratched her ears, and talked to her. She kept staring across the river to where old Dan was searching for the trail. She waded in and swam across to help him. I knew that the coon had not come out of the river on her side. If he had, she would have found the trail. I walked up to a riffle, pulled off my shoes, and waded across. My dogs worked the river bank up and down. They circled far out into the bottoms. I could hear the loud snuffing of old Dan. He was bewildered and mad. I was getting a thrill from it all, as I had never seen them fooled like this. Old Dan gave up on his side, piled into the river, and swam across to the side little Ann had worked. I knew that it was useless for him to do that. I was on the point of giving up, calling them to me, and going elsewhere to hunt when I heard the ball of little Ann. I couldn't believe what I heard. She wasn't bawling on a trail. She was sounding the tree bark. I hurried down the bank. There was a loud splash. I saw old Dan swimming back. By this time, little Ann was really singing a song. In the bright moonlight, I could see old Dan clearly. His powerful front legs were churning the water. Then I saw a sight that makes a hunter's heart swell with pride. Still swimming, old Dan raised his head high out of the water and bawled. He couldn't wait until he reached the bank to tell little Ann he was coming. From far out in the river, he told her. Reaching the shallows, he plowed out of the river onto a sandbar. 
Not even taking time to shake the water from his body, again he raised his head and bawled and tore out down the bank. In a trot I followed, whooping to let them know I was coming. Before I reached the tree, old Dan's deep voice was making the timber shake. The tree was a large birch, standing right on the bank of the river. The swift current had eaten away at the footing, causing it to lean. The lower branches of the tree dangled in the water. I saw how the smart old coon had pulled his trick. Coming in toward the bank from midstream, he had caught the dangling limbs and climbed up. Exhausted from the long swim, he stayed there in the birch thinking he had outsmarted my dogs. I couldn't understand how little Ann had found him. It was impossible to fall the tree toward the bottoms. It was too much off balance. I did the next best thing. I cut a long elder switch. Unbuckling one of my suspenders, I tied it to the end and climbed the tree. The coon was sitting in a fork of a limb. Taking my switch, I whopped him a good one and out he came. He sailed out over the river. With a loud splash, he hit the water and swam for the other side. My dogs jumped off the bank after him. They were no match against his expert swimming. On reaching the other bank, he ran down river. Climbing down out of the tree, I picked up my axe and lantern and trotted down to another riffle and waded across. I could tell by the bawling of my dogs they were close to the coon. He would have to climb a tree or be caught on the ground. All at once their voices stopped. I stood still and waited for them to bawl treed. Nothing happened. Thinking the coon had taken to the river again, I waited to give them time to reach the opposite bank. I waited and waited. I could hear nothing. By then I knew he had not crossed over. I thought perhaps they had caught him on the ground. I hurried on. I came to a point where a slew of crystal clear water ran into the river. On the other side was a bluff. I could hear one of my dogs over there. As I watched and waited, I heard a dog jump in the water. It was little Anne. She swam across and came up to me. Staying with me for just a second, she jumped in the slough and swam back to the other side. I could hear her sniffing and whining. I couldn't figure out where old Dan was. By squatting down and holding the lantern high over my head, I could dimly see the opposite bank. Little Anne was running up and down. I noticed she always stayed in one place of about 25 yards, never leaving that small area. She ran down to the water's edge and stared out into the slough. The horrible thought came that old Dan had drowned. I knew a big coon was capable of drowning a dog in water by climbing on his head and forcing him under. As fast as I could run, I circled the slough, climbed up over the bluff, and came down to where little Ann was. She was hysterical, running up and down the bank and whining. I tied my lantern on a long pole, held it out over the water, and looked for old Dan's body. I could see clearly in the clear spring waters, but I couldn't see my dog anywhere. I sat down on the bank, buried my face in my hands, and cried. I was sure he was gone. Several minutes passed, and all that time little Ann had never stopped. Running here and there along the bank, she kept sniffing and whining. I heard when she started digging. I looked around. She was ten feet from the water's edge. I got up and went over to her. She was digging in a small hole about the size of a big apple. It was the air hole for a muskrat den. I pulled little Ann from the hole, knelt down, and put my ear to it. I could hear something and feel a vibration in the ground. 
It was an eerie sound and seemed to be coming from far away. I had listened. Finally, I understood what the noise was. It was the voice of old Dan. Little Anne had opened the hole up enough with her digging so his voice could be heard faintly. In some way he had gotten into that old muskrat den. I knew that down under the bank, in the water, the entrance to the den could be found. Rolling up my sleeve, I tried to find it with my hand. I had no luck. It was too far down. There was only one thing to do. Leaving my axe and lantern, I ran for home. Picking up a long-handled shovel, I hurried back. The sun was high in the sky before I had dug old Dan out. He was a sight to see, nothing but mud from the tip of his nose to the end of his tail. I held on to his collar and led him down to the river to wash him off. The water there was much warmer than the cold spring water of the slough. After washing him, I turned him loose, right back to the hole he ran. Little Ann was already digging. I knew the coon was still there. Working together, we dug him out. After the coon was killed, I saw what had made him so smart. His right front foot was twisted and shriveled. At one time he must have been caught in a trap and had pulled himself free. He was an old coon. His face was almost white. He was big and heavy and had beautiful fur. Tired, muddy, wet and hungry, I started for home. I've often wondered how old Dan got into that old muskrat den. Perhaps there was another entrance I had overlooked. I'll never know. One night, far back in the mountains in a place called the Cyclone Timber, old Dan really pulled a good one. Many years before my time, a terrible cyclone had ripped its way through the mountains, leaving its scar in the form of fallen timber, twisted and snarled. The path of the cyclone was several miles wide and several miles long. It was a wonderful place to hunt as, it's a, as it abounded with game. My dogs had struck the trail of a coon about an hour before. They had really been warming him up. I knew it was about time for him to take up a tree, and sure enough, I heard the deep voice of old Dan telling the world he had a coon up a tree. I was trotting along, going to them, when his voice stopped. I could hear little Ann, but not old Dan. I wondered why, and was a little scared, for I just knew something had happened. Then I heard his voice. It seemed louder than it had been before. I felt much better. When I came up to the tree, I thought little Ann had treed old Dan. She was sitting on her haunches, staring up and bawling the tree bark. There, a good fifteen feet from the ground, with his hind legs planted firmly in the center of a big limb and his front feet against the trunk of the tree, stood old Dan, bawling for all he was worth. Above him, some eight or nine feet, was a baby coon. I was glad it was a young one, for if it had been an old one, he would have jumped out. Old Dan would have followed, and he surely would have broken all of his legs. From where I was standing, I could see it was impossible for old Dan to have climbed the tree. It was dead and more of an old snag than a tree, with limbs that were crooked and twisted. The bark had rotted away and fallen off leaving the trunk bare and slick as glass. It was a good ten feet up to the first limb. I couldn't figure out how old Dan had climbed that tree. There had to be a solution somewhere. Walking around to the other side, I saw how he had accomplished his, his feet. There in the bottom was a large hole. The old tree was hollow. Stepping back, I looked up and could see another hole which had been hidden from me because of old Dan's body. 
He had simply crawled into the hole at the bottom, climbed up the hollow of the tree, and worked his way out on the limb. In some way, he had turned around and reared up, placing his front feet against the trunk. There he was. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't cut the tree down, and I was afraid to climb it for fear I would scare the coon into jumping out. If he did, old Dan would jump too and break his legs. I ran plan after plan around in my mind. None would work. I finally came to the conclusion that I had to climb the tree and get a hold of that crazy dog. I blew out my lantern and pulled off my shoes and socks and started shinnying up the tree. I prayed that the coon wouldn't jump out. Inching along, being as quiet as I could, I made it up to old Dan and grabbed his collar. I sat down on the limb and held him tight. He would bawl now and then and all but burst my eardrums. I couldn't drop him to the ground and I couldn't climb down with him. I couldn't sit there on that limb and hold him all night. I would be be no better off when daylight came. Glancing at the hole by my side gave me the solution to my problem. I thought, if he came out of this hole, he can go back in it. And that was the way I got my dog down from the tree. This had its problems, too. In the first place, old Dan didn't want to be put in the hole head first. By scolding, pushing, shoving, and squeezing, I finally got him started on his way. Like a fool, I sat there on the limb, waiting to see him come out at the bottom and come out he did turning around, bawling as he did, right back into the hole, he went. There was nothing I could do but sit and wait. I understood why this voice, had, why his voice had stopped for a while. He just took time out to climb the tree. Putting my ear to the hole, I could hear him coming, grunting and clawing, up he came. I helped him out of the hole, turned him around, and crammed him back in. That time, I wasn't too gentle with my work. I was tired of sitting on the limb, and my bare feet were getting cold. I started down the same time he did. He beat me down. Looking over my shoulder, I saw him turn around and head back for the hole. I wasn't far from the ground, so I let go. The flint rocks didn't feel too good to my feet when I landed. I jumped to the hole just in time to see the tip end of his long tail disappear. I grabbed it. Holding on with one hand, I worked his legs down with my other and pulled him out. I stopped his tree climbing by cramming rocks and chunks into the hole. How the coon stayed in the tree, I'll never know, but stay he did. With a well-aimed rock, I scared him out. Old Dan satisfied his lust to kill. I started for home. I'd had all the hunting I wanted for that night.